My Seven Chakras, episode two forty eight. Let your heart feel for the affliction and distress of everyone. The Seven Chakras, swirling vortices of energy, positioned throughout our body from the base of the spine to the crown of the head, for thousands of years. This ancient wisdom has been passed on from master to disciple. What are the functions of these energy centers? And could these chakras help you unlock your destiny and find your true purpose? Welcome to my seven chakras, and now your host, Aditya Jai Kumar. Kumar. What's up, Action Tribe? AJ here, host and founder of My Seven Chakras, the show where we dive deep into the ancient world to uncover nuggets of wisdom that will change your life. So, if you're new to our movement, then I want to give you a big, warm welcome to My Seven Chakras. You are in for a treat of an episode, a very unique one today. The topic for today is horse-inspired insights into powerful tools for developing collaborative leadership and managing change. So important in today's age. It's very unique, very exciting. Uh, but before we dive into the thick of it, let's listen to one of our Facebook group contributors of the month, Nancy Norwell, uh, and let's listen to what she has to say. She writes, "My name is Nancy Ray, and I've been seeking a spiritual path for many years. Finding the My Seven Chakras podcast has been a godsend. Becoming a member of the Action Tribe." which is our facebook group has given me a way to learn and grow with other spiritual seekers being able to practice daily forms of chakra healing the input of others more advanced plus listening to aj's weekly podcasts has been exactly what i've been looking for for anyone seeking a spiritual path i wholeheartedly recommend my seven chakras and appreciate all aj does nancy thanks a lot for being such an asset to our community you make such a big difference action tribe if you'd like your story to be read out as well and make sure you join action tribe our facebook group that consists of supportive members who will hold space for you to share to ask questions to learn and to take action every month i select a handful of contributors of the month from within our group people who inspire share resources answer questions comment and show up with their best selves just like nancy and who knows you might just be our next uh, contributor of the month to join us visit my7chakras.com forward slash tribe that's my7chakras our website uh, forward slash tribe t-r-i-b-e and with that we are now ready to welcome our guest of today our special guest linda kohanov so linda are you ready to inspire absolutely i love to inspire every day and to be inspired wonderful so linda kohanov is an inspirationally recognized author speaker and pioneer in the field of equine facilitated learning where horses help teach people leadership non-verbal communication relationship creativity and other advanced human development skills her organization epona quest worldwide serves clients on six continents linda's five books include her latest the five roles of a master herder have been translated into french german dutch and czech and are used as texts at universities so thanks a lot for joining us today linda thank you it's my pleasure to be here ajay wonderful so really really exciting and uh, to start off our interview today let's begin with some inspiration like we always do uh, linda what is your favorite inspirational quote and how do you apply that in your life one of my all time favorite quotes is from george washington and he wrote a letter to one of his nephews about how to be successful in life and this is what he said let your heart feel for the affliction and distress of everyone and that quote it affects me every day because when we go out in the world and we want to engage change and inspiration we also step into situations where there's conflict and suffering and we need now more than ever people who are open hearted and capable of having the tools to handle extreme situations but not to lose their ability to feel emotion and feel empathy for others because when we get burned out and we lose our ability to feel empathy for others that i believe is the root of a lot of continuing suffering 
mm-hmm. and the inability to to really find out what's going on with people, relate to them, and to help them shift things so that they can live an inspirational life that is as free of conflict as possible, but also knowing that they can stand up and handle it if it happens. Wonderful. I love this quote. This, in fact, has been the first time that this quote has been shared on our show the court action tribe is let your heart feel for the affliction and distress of everyone and i think it's really powerful once you're able to tap into uh, the empathy and feel empathy for someone else's situation which of course is different different from sympathy but to really empathize with someone's situation taps into your very human qualities and that allows you to impact change in a greater way uh, uh, i've been studying Uh, about the neurons within our mind and once we tap into empathy there's something very you know magical that happens you automatically energetically go into someone else's situation go into their shoes so to speak and you're able to look at their situation from their perspective and it also taps into humility because you, you know you are in this phase in your life you're in this situation and so many bad things could have happened but they didn't and you are here and you do have certain powers and capabilities to make uh, someone else else's day better so really really wonderful quote thanks a lot for sharing that linda absolutely so with that wonderful inspiration uh, from george washington let's dive in uh, what inspired you to write your book linda the five rules of a master herder a revolutionary model for socially intelligent leadership this is my fifth book and every time i write a book i do research that leads me down unexpected paths and so this is a great example of that when i was writing my fourth book the power of the herd a non predatory approach to social intelligence leadership and innovation i was researching the history of leadership in multiple cultures and i found that nomadic pastoralists these are tribes that migrate with large animals employ an amazing socially intelligent form of herd management that allows these um, interspecies communities to move, move across vast landscapes so these people don't have the benefit of fences and mm-hmm. they have very little reliance on restraints and yet they're keeping these powerful animals together um and they are standing up to really aggressive adolescent bulls and horses um they are capable of helping foals and um cattle be born they're milking them they're taking care of all of their needs they're managing the group and the studies of these nomadic pastoralists show that because they aren't using restraints and fences they have to gain the trust of the herd while they also keep them together and these people have to deal with predators they have to deal with changing climates they have to protect and nurture the group while keeping these massive sometimes aggressive horses and people together and so to achieve this complex goal i noticed the phenomenon of what i began calling the master herder emerges and i use this term to describe a strong compassionate well balanced leader who also acts as a caretaker and a guardian such a person has to master five roles of power and social influence and it has to be capable of using them fluidly interchangeably as needed and so this is beyond leadership the five roles are the leader the dominant the nurturer companion the sentinel and the predator and so human beings are omnivores we have some aspects of, of predatory power but these master herders to keep these animals trusting them and being keeping them together they have to engage the other four forms of power and influence in their non predatory forms and the mistake we make in our culture a lot of times is we over identify with the predator role and when we have to use power a lot of times we're combining it with predatory influence and and to realize that you can use the leader role or the dominant role in a non-predatory way that actually creates safety and protection and um moderates conflict in the group was quite a revelation for me mm-hmm. and once i began to share this with people um their lives would instantly change got it got it so really inspiring action tribe just imagine that you are a nomadic pastoralist 
I can't even pronounce that properly. But you're a you master just, herder. <laughs> you're a master herder somewhere in the steppe or maybe somewhere in the barren land. And you're moving from place to place. You don't have a particular home. You know, that's the idea of being a nomad. And you have to manage the, uh, you know, 100, maybe 200 animals. You don't have the benefit of a fence, right? And you have... Uh, changing weather, harsh weather in many cases, and you've got different tribes who are trying to attack you or maybe trying to uh, steal or rob your 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 flock, your animal. So what are you going to do? So that's exactly what we're going to learn today. And we're not only going to learn that, but we're going to learn how you can use those principles and those skills and those mindsets into day to day life whether you're at your work or you're at your home whatever it might be there's a lot to learn over here but before moving on linda uh, let's break down the term socially intelligent leadership what exactly does that mean um social intelligence means that you have the capacity to um Use your emotions and the emotions of others as information for making decisions so that you aren't just operating from an intellectual base, but you have the capacity to notice when somebody's feeling afraid or somebody's feeling aggressive or threatened, and you know what to do about that to bring everybody back into balance and cooperation. Mm -hmm. That's so really, you are really using you're using your mind, you're using logic, but you're also using emotional intelligence, and you're making decisions um, based on a really sophisticated capacity to moderate conflict and deal with people who are maybe trying to work at odds against you and pr start to bring people together and start to move them in a production productive direction. Wonderful. So what comes to my mind is that you are not just using leadership by force which happens a lot but you're being more of a facilitator you are facilitating that discussion you're using a lot of observation to notice who might be uh, you know uh, triggered or worried or not feeling safe to express their voice or their thoughts and you're ensuring that everyone's in this together which which is which is amazing which is using like you mentioned your social intelligence your emotional intelligence but my question right now is what got you interested in ancient horse herding cultures you've alluded to that a bit but what's the story behind that what what when was the first time that you really sort of were fascinated by these ancient horse herding cultures it all started by being really disillusioned with humanity. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was working in radio and I was also a music critic and um, I was dealing with a lot of really famous musicians who had, you know, tremendous egos and um, one of the things that I noticed was that um, people who, most people are taught to suppress emotion, you know, to hide what you're really feeling and then wear a mask of whatever socially acceptable emotion you think is relevant. Relevant. But musicians and artists are rewarded sometimes very extravagantly for expressing emotion. Mm -hmm. But musicians don't lead any better lives than we do. And I was like, it just seems like suppression and expression of emotion are two sides of the same dysfunctional coin, and everyone is driving me crazy. So I live in outside of Tucson in Arizona, and it's easy to have horses here. You don't have to have barns because it never gets cold enough for that. Um, and I decided to buy a horse so that I could ride into the desert and find some peace and renewal just to get as far away from people on a regular basis. And not that I was ready to give up on the human race. I just really needed a break. Mm -hmm. And what I found in instead was that the horses were showing me places of imbalance that I had. Mm -hmm. And they were also showing me that they were able to do something with emotion that was neither about suppression or expression. They actually had what I realized over time was kind of like a four-point model for emotional intelligence, which is they feel the emotion in its purest form. Then they get the message behind the emotion. They change something in response to that message, and then they let it go and they go back to grazing. And most people, people who suppress emotion, do everything possible not to feel it mm -hmm. to begin with. Um, people who express emotion express it. They feel it. But, man, they just express it over and over and over again. And, you know, with musicians who are um, rewarded for this, they might actually put themselves in situations where they experience the same emotions over and over again so that they can write the next hit song. So in rap, you might find somebody who puts them into situations where they're filled with rage. Right. Um, and in, you know, cl crying in your beard 
your country music, you might find that somebody um, gets involved in one ill-fated relationship after another. Yeah. Um, and since nobody's really using the emotion constructively to move on, we're caught at, at step one. And the mm-hmm. horses do these three additional steps, and they lead incredible lives, and they have incredible resilience. They can be frightened you know, about a lion walking by, and they can run, and then the next minute, they let it go, and they go back to grazing. They don't stay up all night, as far as I can tell, and, and worry about why God invented lions, you right. know, and about the injustice of that. Um, and you can see also, like, if a stallion is kind of pushing his mares around, the mares will feel anger, because when you're somebody's pushing into your space or pushing you around, anger is the alarm and gives you the energy to set boundaries and claim your space. And so that these mares will um, gradually increase the intensity of their objection, until they might finally turn around if he's not paying attention and just kick the living tar out of him. And then you'll see them like five minutes later all standing under a tree. They've all gone back to grazing. It's not Mm -hmm. like they have to go to counseling and the mares have to talk about why the stallion won't respect them and the stallion has to talk about why their mares are so crazy. Right. You know, they just make these adjustments and then they move forward with life. So their lives are filled with huge amounts of peace during the day and minor adjustments to situations that might bring up negative emotions, but negative emotions are simply course correcting their emotions. And so I really began to understand the language of emotion in part through doing some research. um, And one person I found um, that was really good at deciphering the messages behind emotions was a woman by the name of Carla McLaren, who's written some very interesting books on that subject. Wonderful. So as we're learning today, and based on what you said, emotions aren't really bad. Emotions, in fact, are good for you. Uh, because they can help act like a GPS uh, pointing you in the right directions. But what is bad is if you keep having those recurring emotions, uh, chronic emotions that you don't let go, that's when things can become challenging, especially like musicians, because all they do, uh, and their job, in fact, is to express their emotions, right? To create the music. But if you're stuck in the same genre, uh, depending on whether it's uh, rage metal or rap or maybe... Uh, heartbreak love songs uh you know you 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 are in that uh same cycle of the same emotions which can have a negative impact on yourself as well as people who are working with you like in your case uh, <laughs> so thanks a lot for sharing that story so what was your childhood like as a child did you ever think that someday in the future you would be studying horses or master herders i was very much attracted to animals when i was growing up in fact i I felt at times, you know, as a child that I would rather be an animal um, than a human. Mm -hmm. And um, my parents, I was particularly attracted to horses and my parents were afraid of horses. So I got to ride my friend's horses, but I never got to do anything meaningful with horses as I was growing up. And like I said, once I was in my 30s, in the 1990s, I, um, I was successful enough that I finally said, wait a minute, I'm in charge of my life. I'm going to go out and buy a horse. And um, as I noticed what was going on with the horses and what the horses were teaching me, I thought, wow, somebody should bottle this and Mm. and hand it to humans that I'm learning something from horses that I never learned from humans. And a lot of it was nonverbal in the beginning. But you know, scientists have shown that even among humans, only about 10% of our communication is verbal. Right. So where do we go to exercise that other 90% of nonverbal communication. Well, as it turns out, horses are phenomenal teachers of the other 90%. And um, so they're reading your body posture. They're reading your intention. um, They're reading whether you're – they can tell if you're hiding an emotion. um, And there's different responses that they have that that show you that they're picking up on this. And yet they don't hold grudges and they don't judge you. So, for instance, I had a woman who um, had been raped and she was – doing some work. I I do some work therapeutically also, um, usually in combination with a therapist of some kind. Um, So a therapist brought a woman to me to do some work with the horses, and this woman had been been raped. And she was standing there, and she was crying, and the horse just like sighed like a, uh, and just turned and walked away from her when she was crying. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I think a lot of times when they do that, they're not judging you. They're actually Actually, showing you that there's a deeper, there's an emotion underneath that that you haven't accessed or that you won't acknowledge. And she stood there and she goes, "I, I don't know what it is." And then she started to access the anger underneath 
the the feelings of you know sadness and, and being hurt. And she realized that yes, anger is an emotion that arises when somebody violates your boundaries. And I mean, how much more of a violation can you have than rape? And so she had tremendous anger underneath. And as she started to tap into that, she wasn't acting out the anger to the horse. She was just sort of taking her fist and pounding her fist on a fence post and talking about how the violation and how angry that made her feel. And when she did that, that horse walked back over and wrapped his head around her and gave her a hug. And uh, she was just astonished. It was it was life changing for her to realize that anger was a legitimate emotion and that you can ex- you can explore it and get the message behind it without taking it out on others and that's what that horse was rewarding in her wow that's that's almost like a like a miracle it's it's incredible to note uh, how close we are to animals even though uh, we seem to be a bit more disconnected these days uh, compared to how it was in ancient times now uh, going back into the ancient times let's talk a bit about the master herder what what was this person's responsibility what did they really do well just about everybody who works with the animals has to have of these five access to these five rules or you can get hurt and killed i mean mm-hmm. so you have to gain the animals trust by caring for them and in these herding cultures they eat much less meat than we do their wealth is measured by how many healthy living members of a herd that they have and they actually um, very rarely slaughter one of their animals. They mostly subsist on milk-related pro- products. So even with horse cultures, they, they have a lot of products made from mare's milk. Mm-hmm. And um, and they trade milk-related products with settled cultures for grains and things like that. So um, in terms of our culture, these people eat a lot less meat than we do. They name all and if they do have to cull one of their animals, which means killing to keep life in balance, um, they do it in a very ceremonial way. Um, and the animal is respected in multiple ways. And among certain nomadic cultures, like the Mongolians, um, they are Buddhist-based cultures. And so they actually believe that they can be reincarnated as one of the five animals that they work with. And so there's this feeling of, you know, sacrifice and communion that, you know, they a lot of these cultures like the reindeer people um, in uh, Siberia believe that they are half human, half reindeer. The Fulani herding cultures, they are now um, Muslim based, but they still have similar kinds of beliefs. They, they believe they are half cattle, half human. Um, and so a lot of these horse related cultures in the steppes also believed they were half horse, half human. And when people in the 1970s, went out and studied a lot of these cultures, they found that in terms of behavior, that is absolutely true, that the humans in those cultures learn as much from the animals and fit into the animal social system as much as the animals learn from the humans. And so you really do, in those cultures, become more horse-like or more bull-like mm. or more cow-like. But... Um, so that you can fully enmesh in their culture and influence the culture. But the master herders are very sophisticated in that they understand the use of all five of those roles. One of the things that we've lost in our culture, um, in all sedentary cultures, is we've lost the understanding that among large animals like horses and cattle, the leader animal in the herd and the dominant animal in the herd are two different animals and that they perform different um, functions that lead to an enhanced life for everyone in the herd. And in mm-hmm. our culture, a lot of times we mix up leadership and dominance. We don't know the difference between the two, and we use them in a really clumsy way as a result. So the first thing a master herder learns is when to use the leader role and what that looks like and when to use the dominant role and what that looks like. And they keep the herd together by engaging. They spend most of their day in the nurture and companion role. They name their animals. They they pet their animals, which releases a hormone called oxytocin in the animals and the humans. And the hormone oxytocin buffers the flight or fight response in favor of a calm and connect response. And so oxytocin, when you're spending large amounts of time with animals and you engage with them affectionately, you're actually causing your your biochemical makeup to be shifted Mm -hmm. away from aggression and fear into to a place of connection and trust. Interesting. Interesting. And, and uh, you know, what came to my mind was that a while back I was 
researching this hormone and it seems like this hormone is called the love hormone right because when uh, it is new mothers are holding their baby that's the same hormone that's released that builds the bond and deepens the connection between the mother and the offspring absolutely and that's you know for many years they thought that's primarily what oxytocin did was it was released during labor and milk production and mm. then there was a woman scientist by the name of Kirsten Ubnus Muberg in Sweden and she had a child and noticed that she had a huge behavior change like she was in this really highly competitive scientific world and all of a sudden she has this child and she's filled with with love and a feeling of oneness for everybody and suddenly trusting people and reaching out to people. And she was like, she knew enough about herself, about how competitive she was to go, oh my God, something has changed my behavior. Mm, and right. she went back and studied oxytocin and also found that oxytocin can be released in men. So it's not just in women, it's right. also in men. And it's when men engage in caring behavior. And one of the most reliable ways to release oxytocin in men or women outside of childbirth situations caring for animals the animals by petting an animal they had a study in south africa that showed that when a person petted a dog for 10 minutes oxytocin doubled in the dog that was being petted but was also doubled in the person who was petting the dog so it's a right. uh, it's an equal opportunity love drug wonderful so thanks a lot for sharing that about oxytocin the equal opportunity love drug i love that now uh you, we've spoken a, about a couple of the five roles and you did mention them at the start uh, we've spoken about the leader role and the dominant role and the fact that within the herds it might not be the same person or the same animal that has both the leader and the dominant role it might be different animals right so could you give us an overview of the five roles just as a reminder for our listeners sure um and i'm going to define them just slightly here yeah so um the leader role um, is is has a drawing, inspiring energy. Um, the leader in a herd is an animal that doesn't um, automatically run when it sees a lion. The the leader is a is a calm presence that centers everybody, and that everybody looks to to decide um, whether they should run or fight or you know, relax or whatever. Um, in humans, leaders are also highly inspirational. So they're, they're always looking for new ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to inspire people toward a vision. And they can be highly charismatic. Um, and they're not afraid of new things. They're not afraid of novel situations, humans or animals. Whereas the dominant in a herd of horses is a lot of times... Um, skeptical of whatever's new because the dominant is oriented toward protection and a lot of times the dominant will herd the group away from a new thing um, and that is to ultimately protect them and then you'll see the leader animal kind of stand there and assess the situation and then maybe start to move toward the new thing with appropriate caution and that everybody follows the leader in that way uh, but the okay. dominant also has a divisive energy. So the, the dominant role has a driving, pushing energy to push everybody away from something or toward a goal. Or the dominant pushing energy can break through resistance. You know, so if somebody's lazy or dragging their feet or, you know, resistant, the dominant energy is needed to push through and motivate them to move forward. Sure. But the dominant role is also divisive so that um, among animals, when two animals are fighting, the dominant will run into the center of that fight and push the two away away and um so if you have to break up fights between people if you have um so as a parent a lot of times we are using the dominant role uh, but we're not really understanding that that's that's the use of that role and that we can use it in other places effectively so if your child is running toward a street and you run over and you push them away from the street that's the use of the dominant energy if you have two children fighting over a toy and you put a stop to it and you break it up that's the use of the dominant energy but the problem is, is when people don't realize that after that, you have to then move to the nurture a companion energy, which is to find out what's going on, how you can support others, um, and then also maybe lead them and draw them and inspire them toward a new vision. And so I just described there how a person might have to use all three roles in close succession. Um, another role that we've lost contact with quite a bit is the role of the sentinel. And... When we look at shepherds and herding cultures, we see that usually there's one or two people engaging the 
sentinel role, which is they're standing away from the herd a little bit, and they're watching the herd dynamics in relations to threats and opportunities in the environment. Um, and among horses, horses trade the sentinel role so that, you know, five or six horses may be grazing or lying down and one or two may be kind of milling around the edges watching out. And then they alert the herd if something um, significant comes up. But the sentinel also alerts others to op- unexpected opportunities that are coming along. Um, one of the things that happens in our culture a lot of times is we've let go of the sentinel role as one that we trade and we like pay professional sentinels like uh, a law enforcement person is paid to use the sentinel role and the dominant role usually. And they don't mm-hmm. really a lot of times have access to the other three roles. Um, a parent, you know, a lot of times you'll find a single parent is suffering from sleep disorders because they are put in the perpetual role of sentinel and that's exhausting you know Mm -hmm. they're having to watch out if their teenagers sneaking out at night or you know what are the dangers in the neighborhood um and so if you don't have access to a community where everyone's alternating the sentinel role, you can become extremely exhausted and filled with anxiety and sleep disorders. And and then finally, all those four roles are separated from the predator role. And the predator role is simply what keeps life in balance with the available resources. Um, Among horses, horses are not predators, and they can engage and protect themselves and use the dominant role to drive off predators without engaging in predatory power. In other words, they'll chase the predator off, And then once the predator moves along, they relax and they go back to grazing. They don't get together and, you know, plan and hide behind rocks and kill the predator, you know. So they can, you you can protect yourself and the herd without using the predator role. A lot of people don't realize that. Right. Our culture is is hyper predatory because we live in a conquest oriented culture, um, and so a lot of times people don't realize you can use the dominant role without bringing in the predatory energy, and um, so the dom- dominant role doesn't have to be as harsh as it's often presented by people who combine those roles. But the predator role is the part that says, okay, the economic climate is changing, and maybe I need to cut some. Pro- programs to support the long-term survival of my organization. And so maybe I have to decide right. thoughtfully which programs to cut, and I might have to lay some people off. Um, but if it's done in the spirit of keeping life in balance rather than just profiting at everyone's expense indiscriminately, then the predator role is useful, just like lions are useful in nature. So, so, so that's really useful. You spoke to us about the leader role, dominant, nurturing, the sentinel role, and the predator role. And what I really loved was the difference that you pointed out between the leader and the dominant role. And the leader is someone who is inspiring. He's really he or she is really a calm presence, the centering energy of the entire group, and someone who's not afraid of change. On the other hand, the dominant is more of a skeptic and wants to protect the tribe. Uh, but when the person receives uh, the message from the leader that it's all right and you know it's it's safe, then the dominant uh, person is responsible for enabling change for the others once it's safe, right? Yes. Got it. And got it. So yes, this is that's, really interesting. That's so well done. And you know, ultimately, in these herding cultures, is that because these people uh, sometimes go out and have the animals graze during the day and they bring them back to camp at night but they may send one or two herders out with a large herd during the day and those people at that moment have to know when and how to use all five roles because they're with those animals they need all five roles so they don't necessarily have a division of labor Um, they Mm -hmm. they know when and how to use all five roles the same thing with a parent a parent needs to know when and how to use all five roles. But a lot of times we find that, you know, we have a nurturing, a deeply nurturing mother who then doesn't engage the dominant role or the leader role during the day and just says, wait till your father comes home and Mm -hmm. puts the father in the position to be the dominant disciplinarian. And the the problem with over-specializing in any of these roles is that each role has a shadow side of dysfunctional behaviors that arise 
is when we over rely on one or two roles. And that's sure. one of the things that I do talk about in the five roles of a master herder. Got it. So that's, that, that was actually one of my questions. Uh, you know, like you mentioned that if you overemphasize a particular role, it might actually be not good for you. It might be bad for, you know, the group as a whole. So could you give us an example of uh, when this can happen? Oh, yes. Let me give you an, like a slight example. Let's see if I can cover all five roles and how they look dysfunctional when you overemphasize them. So I, I think it's pretty obvious how dangerous it is when somebody overemphasizes the predator role. Um, and predators don't always kill people, but they tend to seek out others' vulnerabilities and use them against the individual for personal gain. So if you have an overly predatory boss or, or colleague, you can't admit your skill deficiencies. You can't ask for help because you know that the predator has an inclination to degrade, fire, or take advantage of someone who may simply need additional training to excel. But again, on the upside, people who use the predator role effectively can make tough decisions during lean times. So as in nature, they keep life in balance with available resources. People who overemphasize on that role are actually overtly intimidating. So one way to tell the difference between somebody who's over predatory and somebody who's overly dominant is the overtness of the intimidation. Um, predators tend to be sneaky. And so they kind of like slink around the edges and look for vulnerabilities to achieve self-serving goals. And they can, you know, be like the lion stalking a zebra in high grass. But people who overemphasize the dominant role are overtly intimidating. And, Here's this thing that all, all naturally dominant people and, and animals will do um, when they don't know how to use this role in its mature form is that they will attack others for little or no reason. So like with dominant horses, you'll see a bunch of horses kind of grazing and the dominant horse will come in and push, attack one for almost no reason at all and push others away from something um, and then stand there and guard it for a while and then just, you know, move along. And what they're doing is this makes sense to, to these dominant animals because what they're trying to do by attacking others for little or no reason is to keep everyone a little bit on edge. And then they feel like they have more control that way. But that kind of control is very limited. You can be 75 years old and be what I call an immature dominant, which means you attack people for little or no reason, or you make a big deal about small things, or you tend to shame people or embarrass people. Um, and a lot of times these people don't even realize they're doing this. It's almost like a makeup of their, their initial genetic nervous system or something. But mm -hmm. over time, they can learn to fade out of that behavior because it actually causes them to be the least trusted person or least trusted herd member. Um, and so if they can learn how to use the divisive power that breaks up fights and the driving power that protects or pushes through resistance, they're going to use that role in its mature form. But if they're overemphasizing that role, they're going to be very skeptical of change. They're going to feel – because they know that they only really have power over the status quo. So, sure. you know, they, they just really try to keep things the same or they try to go back to something in the past because they feel like things are shifting too fast for them and they don't have enough control. Um, so in a crisis, an immature dog dominant will increase panic and decrease thoughtful problem-solving skills. And um, it's just um, a real problem. And then you can have a leader, on the other hand. These people are attracted to novel situations, um, but they also uh, can get too far out in front of others. You know, they don't mm -hmm. come back around and educate people enough. Or they can be like, I've got this great vision, and, and now everybody else needs to figure out the details. Don't bother me with the details. Um, when they lack nurture or companion skills, people who overemphasize the leader role, they'll become impatient with colleagues and employees who need more information or training to catch up. They won't necessarily intimidate them like a dominant would or a predator would. They're just like, Ugh, I don't have time for this. You know, get your mm -hmm. act together and catch up. And then they can also become workaholics if they're lacking in the use of the dominant role. So they don't know how to really get people on track and push through resistance um, and so you'll, you'll find these leaders say, well, you know, it's just easier to do it myself because they don't have enough skills to delegate. Right. And they, they can also seem very aloof and self-absorbed, especially when they're hyper-focused on the mission or the goal. Have you ever met a leader who has 
some of those qualities? Oh yeah, I was just trying to, you know, uh you know, use these masks and see which, you know, which leader it fits and what came to my mind was uh, Steve Jobs. I was trying to find, you know, which bucket uh, he, you know, he, he was falling under and, you know, what comes to my mind was he was definitely a leader for sure. He was forward thinking, but at certain times, uh, it seemed as if his uh, employees couldn't catch up. And at that point, he resorted to anger. And that's what I, I, I read about. Um, and I'm guessing that, of course, he was a great leader, but at times he wasn't able to communicate uh what his vision was uh, in a language that his employees understood. But of course, that was a resort over a period of time, but they were challenges, correct? Yes, and actually, I use Steve Jobs um, in the book as an example of somebody mm. engaging what I call the power triumvirate, which is okay. he had asked, um, he had a, like an unconscious access to the leader, dominant, and predator roles, but very little facility in the nurture comp- companion role and right. and very little facility in the sentinel role. So you can see how like he was an immature dominant for sure because he would attack people for yeah. little or no reason. He had access to the predator role because if you couldn't catch up fast enough, he'd cut you. You were done. You know, right. he fired people a lot. And he also had access to the leader role and so he would be like have these amazing visions. But he was a bit of a predatory leader um, because I've, I've worked with some people who who actually worked with him, in that he would take others' ideas and use them for himself. Oh, yeah. And take credit for them. And, you know, other people are known for this, too. Um, And so you can see that somebody who has access to those three roles but doesn't know how to use them consciously in their mature forms can really be quite... um, quite a problem to work with. I mean, he seemed to get a lot done. I'm sitting here talking to you on a Mac, right? But he also lost tremendous amounts of money. He lost tremendously talented staff members, including his initial partner, Steve Wozniak, eventually just said, I can't take this anymore, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the waste of somebody who engages these three roles unconsciously without the use of the other two is astonishing. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's 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 a really, really wonderful example that you shared, a really popular example, and I'm sure that people who buy your book, get your book, will be able to dive deeper into, uh, you know, learning more about Steve Jobs and his leadership. Uh, now, for moving from individual leadership, let's move on to leadership in uh, in the collective form, maybe an NGO or maybe an organization or maybe a large family as well. How was leadership within these herding cultures different from leadership in today's age? What what, what uh, potential problem do you see? Well, um, there's a lot more um, facility and attention to nonverbal communication and the nuances of nonverbal communication when you live with large animals. Because mm-hmm. if you aren't paying attention to that, you're dead. Uh, really. I mean, Horses and cattle can be extremely dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and you don't know what you're paying attention to, especially okay. when they're in groups. Um, and so, you know, the the leadership that we have today is actually um, not not very socially intelligent, just because we've lost a lot of connection to things that herding cultures had to understand on a daily basis. Um, And they practiced it on a daily basis. And they were incredibly mindful people. And they could be socially mindful. So, you know, a lot of times we might study mindfulness um, or meditation. And a lot of times it's about going into an individual experience. But they were able to engage mindfulness in action with others, with other their beings as well as with the environment. So it's like an expanded state of mindfulness. And that's what I teach um, in, in my workshops a lot of times is mm-hmm. how to be incredibly mindful and expand that mindfulness beyond you personally into a much wider sphere and mm-hmm. then also have the tools to be able to affect positive change in situations that are getting out of hand. Mm-hmm. And you are able to be able to, you're able to see when something starts to go awry and, and use a small correction early rather than have things like be kind of clueless and self-absorbed and then have a bunch of things go awry and then be overwhelmed. Right. So I see the sentinel role emerging over here, right? Somebody who takes a couple of steps back and just observes and is on the lookout, observes the dynamics of the group collectively as well as individuals, their emotions, their feelings, their reactions, their body language. 
Correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, the sentinel Great. role is one that um, a lot of people who are naturally talented in the sentinel role are very, very attracted to studying mindfulness and meditation. Um, but ah, if they okay. if they don't have access to the other roles, you'll see a lot of times that they might have they, they can have access to amazing ideas and innovations, mm-hmm. but they don't have the ability to see them through. So I find a lot of times people who overemphasize the sentinel role will stand at the side and then tell everybody else that there's something shifting, and then they step back, but they don't take any action to affect the change. Um, and when they become entrepreneurs and try to bring their own vision through, they're going to need leadership skills and dominant skills and nurture a companion skills to pull that off. And mm-hmm. if they're constantly in the sentinel role, they're always looking for someone to be the leader or dominant to take care and and bring their vision into form. And that's, you know, that's not very useful. I mean, as an entrepreneur yeah. – or even as a as a writer, I need access to all five roles. If I didn't have access sure. to all five roles, I would never be able to even finish a book. So, you know, mm-hmm. and the Nurture Companion is very interesting because, um, you know, they're great at making connections. They're great at gaining loyalty in a family or a group. Um, they aren't overtly aggressive. In fact, they're almost conflict averse. Many of them are conflict averse, but they can yeah. create an incredible, incredibly toxic work environment or family environment when they lack the skills associated with the other roles. So they can be masters of passive aggressive manipulation. They act out anger and frustration in secretive ways. And if you're a supervisor of somebody who's doing this, it's really hard to catch this kind of situation in action. Because you know they'll they'll create a, a, a toxic environment underneath, sometimes just by giving the silent treatment to somebody that they've had it with. Um, and so if you give the silent treatment to one coworker, then it might be hard for that coworker and everybody who works with that person to get anything done. So they, they, uh, they can just also over time create factions and um, look and engage in power plays that are secretive. I talk about this quite a bit in the book. Um, so you also even ha- can have predatory nurturer companions. And a great example of that would be a sexual predator who lives in the neighborhood who's seeking out the lonely child, the one that's picked on by bullies, and drawing that person in and nurturing them and making them feel welcome and then engaging in inappropriate, hurtful sexual behavior as a result. Mm -hmm. So any single one of these roles, when combined with the predator role, can be very destructive. That's why we have to separate the predator role from the other four roles and really know how to use these roles um, in a mature way. Got it. Now, now, uh, Linda, let's talk about organizations that want to change now because many of our listeners are probably running a small business organization or maybe a large business organization or some form of leadership capacity. Uh, you know, we live in a time when change is happening so quickly due to technology. And there are many companies that have been here for ages, right? Uh, they're realizing that if they are to survive, then they will have to change the way that they're doing things. And to add to that, there's a rapid influx of uh, the younger generation employees that are smart, innovative, and future-minded. So what advice do you have for long-established businesses or companies who want to change the way that they've been leading their workforce? How can they adapt to be seen as an ideal place to work at? Well, I think that um, the the companies that I've worked with who even just spent a a couple of days learning the five roles and the shadow sides as well as the productive sides, they've, Mm -hmm. they've moved forward with with some tremendous tools that happen relatively quickly because all of a sudden dysfunctional behavior in organizations starts to make a lot of sense. And then you also have Mm -hmm. an understanding of what to do about that. The other thing that's very helpful with this particular model is that, you know, when you see people acting out in different ways, you don't see it as them being hopelessly defective or a jerk. You see them Mm -hmm. for overemphasizing a particular role. And so you can actually help that person um, recognize the benefits of the role they're overemphasizing and make sure that they know when and how to use these benefits consciously and then mm-hmm. recognize the challenges and dysfunctional behaviors that arise from overemphasizing that role and then help right. them learn when and how to employ the strengths of the other roles to replace the dysfunctional behavior. And when you have an entire staff of adults who understand this and are moving forward in these directions, yes. um, it's really much harder for 
any individual member to manipulate, victimize, or take advantage of others, first of all. And second of all, as more people become proficient in all these roles, somehow there's a lot of energy freed up to engage in creativity. And there's more adaptability. And there's more, not just um, mental intelligence, but social intelligence that uplifts the entire social system. And people can more effectively manage themselves. Ourselves. And all of a sudden, we're learning how to be powerful together. And right. we're, we're actually taking this ancient nomadic wisdom and realizing that now in modern life, we are more mobile. We have more access. We can work at home. We might travel a lot. We might engage with other cultures. We're, we are more nomadic now than we were 50 years ago in terms of the resources we have and the kind of travel we can engage in and the kinds of relationships we can have um, Mm -hmm. with people far away. And so it's really important for us to take these ancient skills now and put them into this new nomadic context and know when and how to use them in the 21st century. So thanks a lot, Linda, for that perspective. Uh, You know, it's important uh, for people to know about uh, these five roles that you speak about, but it's not just one person or the leader of the organization or the company who must know about it. It's so helpful if everyone in the organization or at least uh, the different leaders or managers within the organization that have the power to uh, influence change, if they all know about it, it's so much more better because uh, everyone's in the know. So thanks a lot for that uh, perspective. Now, moving on to my next question, which is not about the organization, but it's about individuals again, you know, uh, difficult people to to work with at work. Everyone has had this experience at at some point in their lives. Uh, Some of the listeners listening to this episode have to deal with them every day, right? So how do you use the five roles of a master herder to lead through potentially maybe explosive situations caused by one or more difficult people at work or within a person's team? One of the first things that's helpful is to watch their behavior and see which role or roles they're overemphasizing or using in an immature form. That's going to help you a lot to understand, first of all, to have some understanding of the nature of the behavior you're going to need to correct. Um, and you're going to need to help, if, if you have an influential position, if you are a manager or leader, you can actually take them aside and make sure that they understand the productive aspects of the role, as I mentioned, that they're overemphasizing, and then outline the dysfunctional behaviors mm-hmm. and talk to them about how this affects the organization and the team as a whole. Um, and so you might be having a kind of like, oh, you, you can also think of it as like increasing the intensity of your what role you're using, right. um, almost like a crescendo in music where you start out softly and you get increasingly louder, you can use the roles as a crescendo. So if you have a person who's acting out in a particular way or refusing to do their job or you know, attacking others for little or no reason, <laughs> you can have a, a conversation that's more in the realm of the nurture and companion, which is... you know, How can I support you to get the training you need to be more effective? Or... Or what's going on in the organization? Is there some conflict somewhere else that that you need some support in handling? Or is there something going on at home and in your personal life that's uh, interfering with your ability to function here? That's more of a nurturer companion, but still professional nurturer companion conversation. Mm -hmm. And then if the person isn't responding to that, the next conversation will be more of a sentinel conversation. In other words, you're going to let them know how their is affecting the the team and the larger organization and the organization's ability to serve clients, let's say. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's really – that's a sentinel conversation. And then you might also be having a bit of a leader conversation with them, which is to get them focused back on – what is the mission of our organization and how does my role fit into fulfilling the mission and what opportunities do I have in the future to move up in the organization and really excel? Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times people just have to be pushed out of their comfort zone. And so after you've gone through those three roles, you might have to engage the dominant role yourself, which is to start to become much 
more um, focused about particular behaviors that have to stop and, you know, being a little more stern. You don't have to be abusive. You don't want to be abusive or shaming or intimidating. That's the misuse of the dominant role. You just want to get more focused and more insistent that they they need to make these changes. They need to make them now. And you have to set up consequences for them if they don't engage, um, you know, the change in behavior that you need. The dominant role has consequences for misbehavior. Right. Uh, and you might give them, you might have a couple of conversations like this. And the last thing the dominant role does is let this person know the predator's coming in next. In other words, we've given you these chances. The behavior has not changed. If it doesn't change, by this date, the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to we're going to have you move on from this organization because you're not serving the organization. And so the last thing the dominant does is warn the person that the predator's coming in next. Mm-hmm. If the person gets back on track, then you give them immediate positive feedback. You don't hold grudges. You don't tell them they're a loser. You just let it go and you go back. Everyone goes back to grazing, back to enjoying life and work. But if the person doesn't change the behavior, they come in and without any anger. You just say, well, you know why you're here, don't you? It's time for you to pack up and leave. Um, I wish you all the best. Apparently, you're not a, the right fit for this organization, and I wish you all the best. So that you don't have to engage the predator role in an angry, impulsive way. The predator role should be used in a very thoughtful way as part of a crescendo of interventions that finally lets you know that it's time for someone to leave the organization. Wonderful. So I really, really like this technique, the crescendo uh, technique which is all about using the right um, right role with the person who's creating the issue at the right time so you don't start with the dominant role you don't start with the predator role which could really affect the culture of the company as a whole because matches messages spread fast right and you don't want that to happen but you start with the nurture move on to the central then the leader Then the dominant, if nothing happens, if things are not moving quite as you expected. And then final, it's going to be the behavioral focused approach with consequences, with warnings if things don't change. So I love this approach and I'm sure that many of our listeners are going to use this in their organizations, in their homes uh, and in different areas where they are the leaders. So Linda, uh, thanks a lot for sharing all these stories, all these ideas with us. What is that one action step that you'd recommend for our listeners today after watching or listening to this episode? Well, I think it would be helpful to actually read the book um, and begin to get a sense you know, it, it has a combination of the history and how this is nature-based um, wisdom, um, as well as um, some some history across multiple cultures. And then start to, to um, the first thing to do before you worry about how to use the roles is to start to notice what roles you might be overemphasizing and what are the advantages to that role and then what are the dysfunctional behaviors you engage in as a result of that. You can also take the Master Herder Professional Assessment, which in terms of professional situations, this will help you understand um, which roles you're really good at and which roles you may even be abdicating. And sometimes abdicating a role is as destructive to an organization as your overuse of it. Um, and so there, there is the Master Herder Professional Assessment at the back of the book, but you can also take it online and have it um, calculated for you and receive a little handout about the roles at my website, which is masterherder.com, masterherder, H-E-R-D-E-R.com, all one word. And here we're not using the word herder as in herding around groups that are unconscious because in herding cultures, they actually consider their animals as uh, important parts of an interspecies society, and these animals are very powerful. And so we've sort of misused the word herder to make it sound like these are thought mindless animals easily moved around, and that's not the case at all. Just as it's not the case to motivate free, empowered people, or even your own children, to get back on task and to do do the uncomfortable thing that would contribute 
to their growth as well as the growth of the family. So Action Tribe, to read the entire show notes for today's episode, including the inspirational quote, the book recommendation, and certain pieces of wisdom or certain stories that you weren't able to capture right away, visit our website, my 7 forward slash 248. That's our website, my 7 forward slash 248, the number. We tend to steer our lives in the direction of the lessons we need to learn. This is an amazing quote by Don Campbell. Action Tribe, no matter where you are in life right now, no matter what stage you are in, realize that you have reached there because of certain decisions that you took in the past and you took those decisions subconsciously to learn something in life a life lesson that will help you on the journey ahead so instead of worrying about whether you will make it out of this out of this challenge fully embrace this moment and the emotions that you're feeling and the challenge that you're going through knowing fully well that everything is happening for your own good so linda talk to us about one life challenge that you had to go through in your life what was the challenge like and how did you get out of it how did you overcome it one of the most significant challenges that um informed my life in a in a profound way was when i rescued a stallion a black arabian stallion named midnight merlin who was extremely violent and couldn't stand to be touched. If you touched him, he acted like you shocked him with a cattle prod and he would come and attack you. And so what I found in working with this horse was that I couldn't just use the nurture companion role with him. Mm -hmm. And so I was the kind of a person who would abdicate the dog dominant role. And I was sort of anti-power because I had seen power misused. And this horse helped me realize that I needed to be powerful with him, to stand up to him, and to help him to use his own power in a more productive way. But I had to learn how to use power in a non-predatory way, and so that I could combine compassion and power, and courage and self-control. And I had to forgive him every day for attacking me, but I also had to hold him accountable for his behavior. And I, so I had to be able to become powerful and then give him immediate positive feedback and a feeling of connection and peace the second moment. And in this way, I had to become, I, I had to transform in really profound ways that have informed my work ever since. So in just one sentence, what would that one major life lesson be that you'd like to share with our community based on the story that kindness and compassion aren't enough to transform those who've suffered from the misuse of power you have to become powerful yourself but you have to use that power with compassion and with mindfulness and maturity got it it's a wonderful wonderful story that you shared with us today And I'm really, really amazed to learn so much about what horses can teach us, not through words, but just through body language and reactions. And you said that you once rescued a black Arabian stallion uh, uh, who was very violent and aggressive and defensive. And uh, you did, you know, initially try the nurture companion role, but that wasn't quite working. And you found that that approach in this situation wouldn't work. You had to use more of the power to really stand up to an animal that is using power, that is used to using power and violence and a bit of aggression. So you you, you changed your approach. You changed, you know, uh, your your way of working with the stallion, uh, but in a non-predatory way. Right, as 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 opposed to how power is used a lot in today's day and age, and you used a lot of feedback yes. to in, to ensure that you were able to develop that sense of connection uh, with you being the herder and the stallion, and that really worked for you. And I'm sure that that uh, you use that approach with uh, with helping people develop their leadership skills as well, uh, which is quite fascinating. So thanks a lot for sharing that story. Thank you, Ag. So Action Drive, no matter where you are listening to this episode from right now whether you are on your way to work or back from work or maybe you're outdoors or you're in your car whatever that might be take a few minutes to feel the emotions that you're feeling right now are you happy are you indifferent are you relaxed 
maybe you're excited about something new or you're afraid of something uh, and you're using the podcast to avoid thinking about it every once in a while it's good to go deep within and connect with your emotions like we're learning today it's it's important to connect with your emotions because your emotions can be like a gps trying to communicate with you and trying to tell you something important about the journey ahead if you're embarking on something new a new project a new venture a new business maybe then i'm sure that you're feeling two emotions two of them you might be feeling a level of excitement thinking about the prospects of experiencing success and every once in a while you might also experience some fear what if things don't work out what if you fail and how will people perceive you so when you have both of these emotions in mind keep this quote by robert kiyosaki in your mind because he said don't let the fear of losing be greater than the excitement of winning so think you know think about that and keep that in your mind and with that we have arrived at the last round for today which is called the wisdom round which has four questions so linda are you ready for it yes great so what is the best piece of advice that someone has ever given you the piece of advice that someone gave me comes from um the horses themselves and the way that they behave um, and what I learned with Midnight Merlin. And so it's a non-verbal piece of advice, but I'm going to translate it into words. Um, and that is, if you have to use power, use it in the form of a, of a crescendo. Start gentle and get, get progressively more influential. And the split second, the of uh, being backs off or starts to recover, respect you or starts to engage you in a more functional way you have to let go of the past you have to forget give them and you have to give them immediate positive feedback um, you have to show them that yes okay now we're on track so um, that was the only thing that that healed Merlin and it's something that I use all the time now because I find that when people have to stand up for themselves or have to influence someone's behavior who is aggressive or resistant they, they feel resentment. And then when the person starts to listen to them, they don't even know, and they're holding a grudge. And that small window of opportunity for someone to change is absolutely closed, unless we can give that immediate positive feedback. Mm -hmm. So name one personal habit that keeps you going, keeps you strong. Several times a week, if not every day, I like to let all of my horses loose on the property and just spend time with them. Um, being a part of their herd and being a part of that amazing feeling of of power, peacefulness, connection, and compassion. So, Linda, do you have a morning routine? What do you do during the first one hour of your day? Oh, I usually um, spend some time with my dogs, too. And, and um, that morning time is, is really the time I spend with my dogs and being quiet um, and then often I go out for a walk in the desert, which centers me and keeps me physically healthy. Great. So name one book that you'd like to recommend for our listeners. This is a book that really changed my understanding of a lot of things. And it's by Peter Kropotkin. It's a very old book, but you can get it on Amazon in its English translation. Kropotkin is K-R-O-P-O-T-K-I-N. It's called Mutual Aid, a Factor of Evolution. And he lived in the 19 or 1800s and he went out to, went out through Siberia to collect um, anecdotes in nature to prove Darwin's theory of evolution. And he found that actually it was not survival of the fittest and competition for limited resources that were so important. But it was sociability and mutual aid that was very important ensuring, in ensuring not just the survival, but the ability of many species and individuals to thrive. So a lot of times in science, compassion is taken out of the formula. And he actually went out in nature and realized that was a huge part of nature, that nature does have a heart. So there you go, Action Drive. You can get this book, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. Uh, on Amazon and I, I also wanted to mention that uh, many of you love the book recommendations shared on the show and that's why 
uh, audible.com is giving our listeners a chance to start listening to books and listen to their first book for free with a free 30 day trial so that you can get to check out their service in case you don't know audible has over 180 thousand titles to choose from for your various devices including best sellers like the chakra system by anadia judith autobiography of a yogi by paramahansa yogananda and a new earth by eckart tolle to download your free audiobook today to start listening to the book go to my7chakras.com forward slash free book once again my7chakras.com forward slash free book to start listening to your next book just like you're listening to this podcast right now So Linda thank you so much for joining us and talking to us about uh the five roles of a master herder and all these and uh, so many more things before you go tell us something that you're grateful for and how we can find you online you actually did share your 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 website but uh, it's always good to share it again <laughs> Yes well I I actually have two websites so I'll share the other one too um what I'm grateful for is that um that I was drawn out of a purely human world into a world of courses and other animals that have taught me more than anything that I ever learned from humans um in profound ways and I'm grateful that I get to work with horses and other animals in teaching people advanced human development skills when they come out here so you can take a look at workshops also um on my websites so my other website also has some workshops related to creativity and social activism and um even some spiritual ideas and that website is eponaquest.com that's e p is in paul o n is in nick a q u e s t.com got it well thanks a lot uh, i'm going to add this link eponaquest.com into the show notes so that our listeners can uh, check out the other amazing things that you do and your company does uh, so linda thank you so much for coming on our show talking to us about leadership and the five roles of the master herder and learning about horses and stallions and taking us one more step closer to a human revolution thank you aj it was a real pleasure You are listening to My Seven Chakras. Go to my s e v e n chakras dot com. Download your free gift. Get inspired and take action. Transform your life today.